wartime children's lives were lit by surprises. Between 1945 and 1951, we saw not only our first banana, but the first washing machine, the first television set. If later we grew angry at the disillusionment and apathy of our elders, perhaps this is why. They treated it all as a dreary mess. They forgot that for us it could have been a brave new world. Change was in the air in the 1950s. Five years after the end of the Second World War, and people wanted to put wartime disruption and post-war austerity behind them. The hope was for prosperity, security and peace, but could this be achieved? was overrun by the armies of the communist-controlled North. The Cold War had reached its Pearl Harbor. A part of the world few Britons had ever heard of became caught up in a battle that was soon to embroil the nations of the world. Now, the festival of Britain opened and wish it a universal success. The 50s began in hard times, with Britain still badly scarred by the physical and financial burdens of the war. Shortages made life difficult, often to the point of exasperation. A coal shortage cut the train services, a steel shortage closed the car factories, there was a serious housing shortage. This room, there's uh, me and my husband in one bed, the baby in the cot, and uh, two in there when uh, it gets a bit warm, you know. In the winter time, I put them all in together because it's very cold up here in the winter. But austerity was beginning to give way to an age of affluence. Over the decade, average wages rose by 20%. Unemployment was virtually nil, and the recently constructed welfare state offered security from the cradle to the grave. Never before in history have the mass of people reached such a standard of prosperity. They earn high wages, they have money to spend on something beyond the mere necessities of life. They demand and get luxuries beyond the dreams of their grandfathers. There is television in council houses. A boy of 17 thinks himself hardly treated if he is denied a motorcycle. Teenage girls turn out in smart frocks. Who quarrels with that? I think of the old days when this class had low wages, poor food, shabby, unwashed clothes, and many lived in slum houses, often without water and decent drainage. The British shrugged off the old puritanical attitudes to borrowing money and living within their means. The 50s saw the country's higher purchase debt rise faster than at any time before or since. Were you thinking of higher purchase or cash? A higher purchase. Yes. Higher purchase. Yes. Uh, did you have any idea what deposit you really wanted to put down? Roughly 30 pounds. I see you've got 30 pounds. Yes. But 30 pounds would be able to give you goods to the value of, say, 150 pounds. One in three households is buying something on HP at this moment. Well over half the furniture in the country is sold on HP. Of every two television sets, one is on HP. Of every three radio sets, one is on HP. And of every five new cars, one is on HP. Three million new houses were built. By the end of the decade, the landscape was being eaten up at the rate of a thousand houses a day. 
Foreign houses give the newcomers advantages many of them have never known before. Hot and cold water, more living space, bathrooms. This is the future. The country has never been so prosperous. As the Prime Minister has said, the standard of living has gone up, we are better fed, better clothed, we are using more electricity, more people have motor cars, bicycles, television and a host of other things which only a few years ago were the luxuries of the few. The 1950s really were the first age of mass affluence in Britain. After the austerity and rationing of the 1940s, vast numbers of people were for the first time able to enjoy the new consumer goods, things like television sets and refrigerators, which up to this point had been very much restricted to a few wealthy people. But behind this affluence, there were still problems. There were groups like the elderly, single parent families, who still lived very near the poverty line. The welfare state had not really solved all the problems. And although Britain was growing and fueling the consumer boom for the many, there were signs that it was not growing quite as fast as it should. Before long, people would begin to comment upon the British disease of poor productivity and bad industrial relations, which was making Britain less effective than her international trading rivals. Edmund Hillary, beekeeper from New Zealand. Tensing Norkey, Sherpa from Nepal, conquerors of Everest, May the 29th, 1953. For the first time in history, a queen would be crowned in sight of her people as they watched throughout the land. Quite sure that all these young people have got help. They're most definitely with it. So much has been said about teenagers recently that I must admit I flinch at stepping on this well-trodden ground again. I certainly am not going to attempt to reach any profound conclusion. All that we hope to do is to observe a new type of teenager, a teenager who is making more money than was ever dreamt of in the old days, who has got a new spending power, and with that power is able to enjoy himself or fails to enjoy himself in a completely different way. Unemployment in the UK did not exist in 1956. There were 10 vacancies for every jobless person. Those between the ages of 15 and 20 were in high demand. Teenagers, guys and dolls, can be trained in a few weeks to earn eight or 10 pounds a week. The shops know it, so every town has a store with teenage departments, thriving on giving the young people the fashions they demand, distinctive teenage fashions. Out went twin sets and pearls, in came stiletto heels and portable transistor radios. Male fashion, which had always been a version of what Dad wore, burst into the marketplace. The generation gap widened as teenagers began to create their own lifestyles, and nowhere was the division more marked than in popular music. In 1956, Bill Haley's film, Rock Around the Clock, hit Britain. The older generation were appalled, and it was banned in many towns. 
This was the early days of the youth quake. Away from the cities, the teenagers of London-based journalists hardly existed. Nevertheless, the rules, the fashions and the tastes of the older generation had been challenged. The end of meat rationing this weekend was the final step in dismantling the whole wartime system of food distribution. The 14-year story told by this book was over. want to boast, but I use Purcell, and she took out her hanky and said, now that's what I call. You know, it was miles whiter than mine. It shook me, I can tell you. I always thought my whites were white until I saw hers. White's white, but Purcell washes whiter. That means cleaner. Monday. How I hate the sight of washing. I used to enjoy it, too, before I was married. But then I only had to do my own undies and summer frocks. This household wash is just plain drudgery. Still, it's got to be done. After all their inroads into the world of work in the war years, women were firmly pushed back into the home. The 50s became a decade dedicated to the ideal family. The role of the wife and mother was seen as vital in the bid to re-establish the old pre-war values. I always like to be home in time to change. He likes to see me looking at my best. If I hurry home, I shall be able to have a doze before I have to think about getting his supper. All the new household goods being advertised enforced the idea of women staying at home. But how could they afford them unless they went out to work? Despite the pressures to stay at home, there were more women workers in 50s Britain than ever before. But how much longer would women settle for limited expectations and lack of opportunity? 